Welcome, rest of you. There'll be a whole bunch also joining in. And uh, this is the kind of event where they can join in at any point in time and ask a lot of questions. My first introduction to Sridhar happened through Akila, our executive director. And uh, a bunch of us attended a full day ideation innovation session that he conducted long, long ago, so long ago, when we could actually meet face to face in a hall. And he had us enthralled. And then subsequently, I kept waiting every time he, uh, he says he's going to come from Bombay, because with people like this, you always want to rub shoulders because through osmosis, you will learn something. And then again, for Tai Chennai, uh, he consented and participated in a podcast. So that is Sridhar for you. Uh, he has also written a book and designed a set of games, which we will be talking about uh, as we go along. An ideator, one of the principal founders of Fathers of Direct Marketing in India. And if you don't know what direct marketing is all about, reach out to him on LinkedIn. Uh, because today is all about ideation and creativity and your questions. Right? Um, he has come up with the creative thinking toolkit, which I having read it and interacted with him, I call it the Sridhar Creative Thinking Toolkit. Uh, he preaches and talks. If you follow him on LinkedIn, there are lots of nuggets of short stories that keep coming in. He retired as the chairman of Ogilvy One and has groomed some of India's leading CEOs and admin. This is his book, Unlock the Real Power of Ideation. And as a carrot for the most enthusiastic participant in, in this particular session, which Priya will decide, I will be happy to ship across a copy of this book to you wherever you are uh, in Chennai. It will be couriered over to you. So that is what is Sridhar, the innovation expert. And what we are doing here in the creative special interest group is not talk about entrepreneurship, but talk about ideas, about creativity, what is new, what is happening. And it sometimes actually go back to the past and learn quite a lot. So I would, I have one request. This is an opportunity for each one of you to ask a bunch of questions. I'm only a moderator and timekeeper here. Sridhar is available. He is donating an hour and slightly more of his time for all of us to go ahead and ask questions. For those of you who can, keep the videos on because as professional speakers, we love to see and um, get the reactions in. Please keep the chat running. If you can unmute and ask the questions to Sridhar, absolutely fine. Uh, otherwise, you can chat and I'd be happy to pass that across. And as with uh, any such event, there is a pregnant pause when we ask for questions, but I'm going to do something different. I follow Sridhar and he goes by the name Sridhar Ramalingam in uh, LinkedIn. So if you search for our Sridhar, you'll get it. Ramanathan, Ramanathan. Slip of tongue here. Sorry. Um, uh, he's known as RS. He's got a podcast called Ask RS. I will cover that towards the end. But search for Sridhar Ramanathan. And I would want Sridhar to start with the story of how he got a job in Ogilvy, just as a starter, Sridhar. So please, over okay. to you. Welcome right. to Tain Chennai once again. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, this is... Uh, getting into Ogilvy was an interesting thing. I was... I worked in an advertising agency called... Okay, I, let, let me quickly tell you. I started my life. I'm a BSc physics and mathematics graduate from Bombay University. I got a third class, incidentally. Okay. And... Uh, so I had to get into a job before the results were out. Otherwise, nobody will give you a job for a third class graduate, right? So I bet the results, got a job, and then I joined Frank Smoy's Advertising, okay? Uh, two years in Crumpton Reef, Frank Smoy's Advertising. And around that time, I had finished about four years with Frank Smoy's. Ogilvy had a new managing director called Mani Iyer. Now, Mani Iyer was a long-time veteran, even at that time. He had worked in Australia, and he, had, he was coming back to India to take over Ogilvy and sort of uh, rejuvenate the entire operation. And I had heard so much about him. And I desperately wanted to go to Ogilvy. Okay. So for nearly two months, I did a lot of homework on Mr. Iyer. What he likes, what does he like, and what he, you know, what's he finicky about, all that kind of stuff. And then I prepared a resume. Uh, now, it is not a resume with two sheets. Okay. It was an entire dossier on me. It was like a police file. Okay. Everything you always wanted to know about Arshidhar was in that file. So, 
after much dissing, he gave me an appointment on a particular date, I think April 5th or something of 1975. Okay. And then uh, on April 4th, I prepared a full dossier. I went to his office in the evening, right, at about 5.15, 5.30, etc. I went to his secretary and uh, handed over the document saying, this is for Mr. Iyer. Now, I said it with a lot of authority and she didn't ask me what it was. So she took it and she was preparing for uh, his papers to be taken home. She just put the folder inside and he would read all his papers in the car. Okay. So uh, he read it and then after that, uh, he said, I'll meet you and all that. And finally, he said, okay, come and see me. Right. For nearly three months, uh, he had said that, look, I want to hire you, but I don't know when and where. So I said, so can I be in touch with you? He said, yeah, no problem. So I had met him on a Thursday. Every Thursday morning, I'll give a call to him, right? Mr. Iyer would be in the office at 9 o'clock. 9, not 5, I'll call him. I'll say, good morning, Mr. Iyer. He'll say, yep. Sridhar here, yep. Any news? No. Right? <laughs> this went on. And finally, one day he called me. He said, come over. So I went in there and he said, listen, I, I wanted to hire you in Bombay, but there is no opportunity in Bombay right now. But in Chennai, there is an opportunity. Are you willing to go? I'm a, I was a Mumbai car, okay. I, I was not, I was born in Coimbatore, but grew up in Bombay, right. All my life was in Bombay, but wanting desperately getting into Ogilvy, I said, listen, even if you had asked me to go to, you know, some Tutukudi or something, I would have gone, right. I don't mean any insult to Tutukudi, but I'm just saying, right. So I went to Chennai. So that's how I got into Ogilvy. Let me start off with one question here. Sridhar, this is a question that a lot of entrepreneurs have asked me. Or it's a comment. Yeah, I am. Am I creative? Can I really be creative? Can I not outsource it to somebody else? But the simple question to you is, am I creative? What would be your answer to that? Not all, of, a, all of us are creative. Okay. It's a, it's a lot of guys who are selfish, who make us believe that we are not creative and only they are creative. So that we go to them. Okay? It's all rubbish. Everybody is creative. I'll give you an example. Okay. It happened to me before the pandemic. I was going to meet a client, okay, and uh, in one of the Mumbai suburbs, a tremendous traffic jam. Our car was stuck, and I was in the back. And then my driver went right across to find out what has happened. A huge uh, trailer had turned over, and to lift it, they would have to get uh, some machine to do it and all that kind of stuff. And I was getting late for the meeting, and my driver said, "I can't do anything about it." Right now. Suddenly, I saw that a whole lot of motorbikes were going from the side. They were going. Only the cars were stuck. So I told my driver that I'll take one of the motorbikes and go. So one of the one of the motorbikes, uh, the pill and ride was free, and I was carrying nothing. I didn't really a diary in my hand. I just said, "Can you give me a lift?" And he gave me the lift to the nearest auto, and I went to my client's meeting. Right now, I was in time, but the client was stuck. But the point I'm making is that. At that time, did I say that I want to be creative? I didn't think that I wanted to be creative. I wanted a solution. The reason why I was pushed to finding a solution is that I was stuck. And I was that I was not willing to be ex accepting that I am stuck. Okay. There is a term that David Ogilvy once used called divine dissatisfaction. Wow. If you are unhappy with your current status, you will find a way to be creative. It is true for all of us. Right? One day you go home, there is nothing interesting for uh, you know dinner. Only you know Thayri Shadam is there. I'm sure you will try a rustle up, you know, bread and jam, this, uh, whatever it is. You know, a lot of things are possible at home. If you're inventive and you're willing to be, uh, or you're allowed to go into the kitchen, you can do hajar things. I always found the most interesting things are kept in a particular shelf in my house. My mother used to do that. My wife also do it. So she is busy watching some, some television thing. Then I'll go rummage, find out, make something to eat, go and give her also something. So that way she is also a partner in crime. You know, so that's all possible. We are all creative. It's just that we are not using it. I can tell you, I can watch, I can prove it to anybody who wants to challenge me also. Beautiful. Thank you, Sandeep Peji. Here's the first question from him, um, Sridhar. I'm going to read it out. How long is the ideation phase? 
How long is it? Ideation phase. Thinking about it in the mind is ideation. Yeah, Drawing yeah. paper is ideation. Uh, one, when should one get out of ideation and take a serious stab at creating the first version? So the thing is that there is nothing called how long. See, uh, how long does it take to win a lottery ticket price? Okay. Sometimes you buy a ticket, it happens. Sometimes for a lifetime, people keep on buying tickets. Nothing happens. Right. So I must tell you a story about lottery ticket, but let's just take half a second. Okay, there is this guy who's desperate, constantly praying to God, saying, God, I must win a lottery. God is not listening to him. One day out of sheer desperation, God says, okay, tomorrow you'll win a lottery price. Okay. And next day, this guy goes back to God and complains, saying, I didn't win the price. He said, boss, but you must buy the ticket, right? <laughs> okay. So it's a question of that. You will get an idea once you're trying to solve a problem or seize an opportunity. Two things, seizing an opportunity or solving a problem. If you're happy with status quo and you're happy with your curd rice and sapar sadam, you'll know, never go out looking for a pizza. Never. I know guys who are traveling to US to stay with their family and will not venture out to try any other cuisine in the US. I am okay with my Mysore Rasampa. What big deal here? Yeah. Beautiful. Now, I am going to tell you about a situation that I experienced and went through before there was a change. <clears throat> but, uh, as the CEO of my company, I call for an ideation meeting. And a lot of my colleagues come, we discuss quite a lot. And finally, my idea gets voted as the best idea and then we go out. How do I get rid of that problem, the CEO syndrome? And you've also mentioned about it in your book. Um, first is the CEO's role is to give the problem and get out of it. Don't sit there. Because willy-nilly, people in this country, most countries, they're all somehow wanting to please the CEO. Even if you say, I'm giving you the freedom, they won't take the freedom. Right? So if I were you, what I will do is that, listen, boss, I want this, I want ideas for this. You must be very sharp in your challenge statement. Whatever that statement is, it should be just one line. Don't give a long spiel. They won't know what ideas you need. Suppose you're looking for new customers, you'll say, listen, I want new customers. By the end of this month, I want to add another 10 customers who we are not doing business with. Give me ideas to that. I'm going back now. I'll be back in about 45 minutes. I want new ideas. So that's the first thing. The second thing that happens is that initially, all the ideas that we're thinking will be very similar, which that you didn't think of. You would have, might have thought of it. Be tolerant. Right? So suppose you go to a new restaurant, okay, you go to a, I'm a classic tambram, I go to a Chinese restaurant and look for vegetarian food there, okay. Then within the vegetarian food, I want to look for familiar names because we are all uncomfortable with the unfamiliar. It's human nature. So the first set of ideas you'll give will be very predictable, very similar, nothing new, all that is fine. So I think we should be completely tolerant and say, this is fantastic, okay? I'm going to bank these ideas. Now, guys, let's look for ideas that we had never thought before. Okay? Now, that's easy to say, but difficult to do. So, we have to give them tools and techniques. I'll give an example, right? So, one of the things I'll say, listen, imagine that Praveen is asked this question. What kind of ideas would Praveen come up with? Right? I am not Praveen, but generally I know what Praveen does. Okay? And his thinking and my thinking are not necessarily similar. So I'll get a new idea. Now, whether Praveen will think like that or not is not the issue. But I got an idea which would not have occurred to me. So the point we are saying is that when you want them to think differently, give them stimulus to think differently. Right. If you say that you want to, you want something new to be cooked, then give them a new recipe. <laughs> if you keep on giving Sametupar by Meenakshi Amal, you only get foods from there. 
true <laughs> yeah uh, absolutely absolutely yeah. now i'm i'm going to come back to that a little bit because it took me a long while uh, to be tolerant uh, and i wouldn't say i'm anywhere near but there is a question here that we have from nishkala what is needed to get out of the comfort zone um i think there must be uh there must be a willing link to inflict yourself to some difficulties you know it's like you're very comfortable sitting at home right you're a potato couch a couch potato not potato couch <laughs> couch potato right but you say listen that my favorite movie is on that but i'm going to go for a walk so to get out of your comfort zone you must do what you think is uncomfortable that is the only way to get out of your comfort zone so what you need to do is put out a list saying what are the things will you hate doing put a hate list right and then you say every day i'm going to do one of this every day without fail for a habit to form you need 30 days you know what a habit is right If from habit you remove the letter h a bit remains you remove the letter a bit remains you remove the letter b it still remains that's what habit is so to get out of your habit you have to do something consistently for 30 days so write out everything that you're not comfortable doing attack it one after the other day by day and then see what it ha- what happens at the end of the end of the month you'll be surprised nice now you have answered a part of this question um, shridhar mm. that as a ceo or the entrepreneur i give the problem and walk away mm. i come back and appreciate whatever comes through you know it's we are parking it uh, but then if i am looking for something quite different to solve a problem maybe mine or for my client uh, how do i go ahead with it do i bring in an external consultant do i add some uh, virus is a wrong word at this point but do i add something external inside i would uh, on behalf of all of us would love to know uh, how can i seed it wherever yeah, i am yeah so the same old people will come out with the same old ideas which is a which is an issue right the thing is i i have a technique called call a friend okay i'm not calling consultant and all that first thing is you have to actually distill your problem into a simple statement right so suppose i say in the last one year i haven't had a single piece of new business and i want ideas for it right so i will call pravin hey boss one year yaar i haven't got a single new client and many of my existing clients have, have reduced their expenditure okay so i want some ideas on how to go for new clients so he'll give me something on the business the gorilla marketing thing works or so outlier marketing thing works or he will see a couple of things in my mind a conversation for 20 minutes max right just call three or four different friends were completely different like from you they don't think like you if you say let's go to woodlands he'll say let's go to a chinese restaurant that kind of guy yeah so consciously look for people whose ideas will be different whose ideas will make you uncomfortable so code discomfort Uh, I'm. I've been married for twenty years, <laughs> just as a, as a point here. But you've already met my wife. I court discomfort and continue to enjoy and live with it. It's on a lighter is, way. Is she is she on this call? She 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 attending this? The next room. So, <laughs> <laughs> but she's not really listening to you, right? <laughs> You're a brave man. <laughs> uh, uh, we run the business together, so I keep pulling her yeah. leg. Here is another question, Sridhar. In India. virtual meet or face to face method works better to promote her platform which is into education especially decision makers are not academicians so this is actually a tactical question that's coming in um uh, specific and i would uh, be happy if uh, i am not communicating your question correctly feel free to unmute and ask shridhar because this is a wonderful opportunity for you to bounce things off um and shridhar will definitely give you a direction if not necessarily the answer hopefully 
um, you cannot, uh, that's fine. She is unable to unmute. Uh, Priya, kindly look into it. I'm going to repeat the question as uh, Rama has put in. In India, virtual meet or face-to-face -face method works better. One of them, I think face-to-face -face works better to promote my educational platform, especially with decision makers who are not academicians. How can I go ahead and ping? What can I do? Is that the question, Rama? Yeah, yes, very much. Yeah. So, um, see, decision makers who are paying money need not be educationists. In most educational institutions, right, uh, the, the decision makers who actually spend the money are not educationists. They are management within quotes. Okay. And there is always this, uh, you know, tension between the management and the education people. Okay. Yeah. Now, what the education guys want, the management says it's cost too much money, whatever it is. And what the management wants, they think that this is all outmoded stuff. You know, this is not what we need to do these days, etc. Right? Most important thing is that in every piece of work, every business, there is a guy who decides and there is a guy who pays. In some cases, both are the same. If I have to get a decision from somebody, I have to persuade that person. I can't be afraid of the person and keeping quiet. So I have to understand what makes this person tick. What does he like? What is he? How does he make a choice? What are the days on which, or not days, but what are the ways in which he says yes? How does he look at any issue? How does he analyze any issue? Right? What makes him say no? So before I go to him, I would have done this homework. Right? And don't go and say, listen, I want approval for this. Suppose you went back and said, you know, one of the things that I've been working or thinking about is that how is it that our, the other institution, which is very close to us, are constantly getting awards? And how come we are not getting awards? Uh, he'll sit up and say, huh, tell me more. Yeah. So first, yeah. appeal to his self-interest. And then weave in your story to show that you're what you are proposing will deliver his self-interest. What's in it for him is the question. If you can tell your story in the context of what's in it for him, there is a fairly good chance that you will make progress. If you're only looking at yourself, what's in it for me, then you'll say, why should I? Yes. Beautiful. Yes. At this, at this yeah. point, um, uh, at this point, Sridhar, I would love if you could narrate your LinkedIn post when you and your colleague were pitching a solution to your client and you were acting as the devil's ad, uh, uh, advocate. So if you could narrate that, okay. uh, I'm certain that would help Rama. Okay. Now, some of the people in LinkedIn felt that it is not the right thing I did. Anyway, that's... No, no, I issue. loved it. I loved yeah. it. So uh, the story that uh, Praveen is referring to, that we were, I mean, we are in the advertising agency. We had to show creative work to a client. Now, every time we went and showed some work, they always found something wrong with it. And then say, no, we can't go with it. So my creative director was frustrated. So frustrated, he said, listen, I'm going to resign. I said, Bhai, when is that my fault? He said, of course, your fault. The point is that the client is actually, you know, tearing my work to pieces. And you're keeping quiet. We are colleagues, right? After all, you, you agreed to this work. And in front of him, you keep quiet. There's no auto on here. So it came to a head and I realized that, you know, it's going to get serious. So I said, let's think this through. And then next morning I went and said, let's, I think one of the things that we are just going and showing work to him and we have to do something else to get the work approved. So I said, let's play, let's set up a presentation mode or presentation style. So we carried alternatives. Every client wants alternatives. Like, you know, if you're painting a house, you want the wall to be painted in four different colors and you'll check it and then choose. I mean, we all want choice, right? Going and buying saris in Nalli, you will buy 14 saris to look at and then one sari you'll buy. And then you go to outside, show it in sunlight, see, come back, all that we do, everything. All of us are doing that all the time. So I said, let's do one thing. Let us carry four different alternatives. Okay. So the first alternative you would present to the client. And then I'll say, but Sanjeev, um, you know, if, if I was in the client's position, I would have these following concerns. So he'll say, yeah, I knew that. So he'll keep it that. And then he'll uh, go to alternative number two. 
and then passion, passionately present that. And then we'll say, Sanjeev, fantastic. I just have one concern. This is this whatever, whatever. He said, yeah. And then he kept that. And then option three, we did the same thing. Option four, I kept quiet. So the client was looking at me eagerly to find out if I was going to say anything about that. Right? So I said, no, I agree with this one. And then client bought it. Now, the moral of the story is not how clever we were. We, we had to understand the client's psychology, which is that he wanted choice before he made a decision. So we gave him a choice. Right? But we wanted to make sure that he made the right choice. So we had to engineer that or stage manage that process, which is what we did. I mean, there are some clients, I mean, somebody wrote to me on LinkedIn saying, uh, we tricked the client. And I, I didn't agree with it. That was his point of view. But the point is that it's not good enough if you have good work. You got to help the other people buy into your work or agree to your work. Super. Um, and I have a bunch of questions. And this is for the, the audience here. If you send me a direct message, I do not know whether uh, you want it confidential or you want me to tell your name, whatever. I'm going to read the question. But if you would like to, you can unmute and talk to Sridhar right away. This is a dialogue. I'm only moderating it. And this is a question. Uh, how can an entrepreneur come out of the thought issue of being in a non-metro? Uh, the thought issue, I'm putting it more as a self-limiting belief here, Sridhar. Okay. How can I, I'm coming from a non-metro and I'm fascinated by Bangalore, Mumbai. How can I come out of this uh, limiting belief is the question that is being asked. Very interesting question. When I was in Chennai, we had a client in Shivakashi. Hind matches. Ah. Okay. Now, we are Ogilvy and Mater, an international advertising agency. Hind matches wants the best agency possible. Right? And then he came to Chennai and appointed us. And we did some very fine work with them. And then we told him that, look, Shivakashi problem for us is that we come there, we have nothing else to do other than your work. But if you come to Chennai, you'll finish our work, you'll have other meetings. Like, you know, your chartered accountant is here, your lawyer is here, something else is here, you can finish. Sir. So it will be productive for you, productive for us also. We don't mind coming to Shivakashi occasionally. But every meeting there is a difficulty. So the person's ambition is not contained by the geography. Right? It's like this. I am at home. Am I eating only home cooked food all the time? Occasionally I go out. I, I never try Chinese. I try Chinese. Right? I, I try. I can't even pronounce the word pizza. So I'll say pizza. I go. Right? But we do all that. We are all adventurous by nature. We seek change. So that's absolutely all right. If you are in a small town, think big. Nobody can put a lid on your thinking. There are several cases I know where the clients thought big and change the world there, I mean, change the category in which they are operating. Plenty of them. So there is no small town, big town anymore with all these internet connections and so on. Where is a small town? There is no small screen, big screen, right? You have your mobile and everybody is connected, everybody is talking. I don't know how many of the people here are from Chennai and outside, how many are there? We don't know that, Sridhar, because okay. Thai Chennai has expanded and we have a lot more people uh, signing up, maybe including from Sivakasi. So, yeah. <laughs> because you are here to light the fire and we are here to take that fire and put it behind uh, so that we can take off. Lovely. Here's a question from Dorai Rajan Suresh Kumar. If your idea is rejected by the decision makers, what to do with that idea? There are a couple of nice options. Depends on what you do. If I'm if I'm that guy, I'll sell it to somebody else. Okay, that's one possibility. But if you're an employee, it's not so simple, right? There will be confidentiality, all that kind of stuff. The thing that to do is that if your if your idea rejected, don't get into a mourning mode. That doesn't mean the idea is dead. It, it means that they are not un, they are not comfortable with the idea to put money on it. Right? It's possible that you did not communicate the power of your idea well enough to them. 
So the way to present an idea is first say, this is what my idea is. If you are making a big speech on what your idea is, it means that you don't have an idea. Your idea must be a single line statement, like the headline of an ad. A headline of the ad cannot be, you know, 700 words. A headline is a headline. I mean, when you want to go and say, I love you to the girl, you just say, I love you. You don't give a speech, right? So that's what you need to do. First, tell them what is the benefit for them to approve this idea. If you say, sir, if we accept this idea, we will actually steal a march or competition in that market. Or if we do this, then we'll actually go and capture a market where the competition is not present. So present an idea, keeping in mind the key concern of the decision maker. What is bothering him? What is keeping him awake at night? If it's collection from clients, then see how they actually say that this will actually, this idea will actually get money in advance. So don't think of your idea in isolation. Think of your idea in the context of your business, in the context of your decision maker. And most important, if your idea is not approved, you know, don't go and, uh, what is the word for it? Uh, feeling sad and grumbling and all that kind of stuff, you know? So don't get into that mode. You can moan for 10 minutes, go to the loo, wash your face and come back. Right? Don't waste time in negative thoughts. This is a very important thing. Brilliant. Uh, answering your question, Kalai is from Chennai. Accurate Saravanan is logging in from Coimbatore. And Kannan Nambi is from Trinalveli. Welcome, all of you. So, Sridhar, you are getting fans all over India, all over again. <laughs> ah, here's a question from Ashish. How to defend an idea when we face multiple questions? I presume he's talking about questions and uh, things being bombarded. Ashish, feel free to unmute and qualify your question further. Sridhar, over to you as I understood it. So, first thing is don't worry about defending. Right? First thing is to say, let me write down all the questions. Okay? Then when you write down all the questions, you'll find that seven people are asking questions. All seven of them are not different. You will actually group. Uh, these, these questions are all about customers. These questions are all about you know, uh, transportation. These questions are all about packaging. Or these questions are all about uh, Octri, whatever it is. You, know, some, you grouped it. And then you just restate. So according to me, the question is this. Have I got your question right? They will say yes. Right? Now you got them already on your, on your side because you're listening to them. You're not defending anything. And whatever is possible, if you have an answer clearly, then state the answer there. And sometimes it's a good tactic to say, on this one, I would like to do some homework and come back to you. Even if you do have the answer. I would like to do some homework and can you give me 24 hours? I'll be back. This actually helps you because they now say that this guy is listening to my questions. He is worried about my concerns and he's keen to find a solution. You have to be all the time coming to as a helpful guy instead of an adamant guy saying, this is my idea. If you don't approve it, I will run away. I'll cry. I'll, you know, I'll floor on the floor, all that kind of stuff. No tantrums. Beautiful. We've got a few more people uh, logging in from uh, Ajay Prasanna from Coimbatore, Nishkala from Chennai, Subhashri from Sivaganga. Not quite Kasi, but close <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, here is another question from Sham Pandale. I hope I got your name right, Sham. Poor academic performance is a major problem in rural and semi-urban area in private schools. The dominant cause is a lack of teaching skill among teachers. Teachers are reluctant to change. What is your suggestion in this case? So I presume the question is, how do we convince them to change? Convince a teacher to change their method of teaching? Yes. So it's a larger question. It's about how do you help anybody to change? Right? First thing is, we have to put ourselves in their shoes. 
what works for them, what doesn't work for them. See, there are a lot of, lot of internal concerns that I have before I change. Will I be able to change? Right? Will it is it the way I have to change? If I change, what will I look like? I mean, tomorrow if somebody says I have to shave my beard, right? I will think hundred times because the moment I shave the beard, my driver will not recognize me. He'll not allow me inside my car, my own car. Yeah. But, uh, so every change has its own price to pay. So we have to be empathetic to that. See the word empathy. Everybody talks about. You know, empathy, you ask, well, what is empathy? People will say it is putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Right? Now, how do you put yourself in the other person's shoes? The first thing you have to do is to get out of your shoes. You can't get into somebody else's shoes with your shoes on, can you? So, the thing is, if somebody raises a question, don't get defensive. You just say, maybe there is an opportunity here to improve our idea and make it more powerful. It requires maturity, it requires patience. So one of the things I do is that before I go to any meeting, for when I'm pitching, I think in terms of all the questions he can ask. And I'm ready with an answer. Right? But when they ask the question, I don't say, yeah, yeah, they thought about that. This is what you can do. I don't do that. I said, that's an interesting question. I didn't really think about it. You know, um, do you think you can give me time? I'll come back to you tomorrow on this. Sometimes he'll answer it. So if you say all questions I'm going to answer tomorrow, he'll say, okay, I think he's going to go ask his father-in-law and bring the answers or something like that. Don't I lose credibility. So you have to understand the psychology of people. Right? It comes from experience. Most important thing is self-confidence. Don't ever give up. Don't let go, but don't give up. So a lot of difference. Beautiful. We have, we have one question from Rajkumar. Even though it is not direct to ideation and creativity, but it is necessary to get through how to approach decision makers. <clears throat> now, decision makers are human beings. Right? It's not a machine. All of them have their priorities. Okay? A decision maker, suppose you say you're the CEO, in the pandemic situation, he is actually juggling several balls in the air. Okay? I mean, how do I manage production? I can't take it to original levels. I can't send people away. There is, uh, you know, stocks lying around, you know, raw material lying around. He has got millions of things. And then for you to get mind space for you, you have to have a very strong reason. So first thing is, if your idea is going to address one of his concerns, that's a fantastic thing to have. So the way to do it is to say, Sir, you know, I was also thinking about our business in terms of how to manage our customer relationship or how to collect money on time, whatever it is. Find out what is his key concern and go with an idea in that case. That is one possibility. The second possibility is that if you have an idea, find out how will it address one of his concerns. So most important thing is first spend time understanding what his concerns are. Don't only think about it when you have an idea. So if I were you, what I'll do is I will actually have a casual conversation either with him or his secretary or whatever it is. Find out all the things that keeps him awake at night. Right? Let us say he's got six things that constantly worry him. Every day that is part of his dialogue in the meetings. Then start looking for solutions in that context. So that's one possibility. Second thing is that you have an idea which is outside syllabus. His syllabus, right? Find out how it can be related to a syllabus and pitch. Now, pitching is very important. Pitching means you're actually going and telling them, look, this is the idea. If you are actually going to do this, these are the benefits. These are the competitive advantages you'll get. And it's not going to be so difficult to execute and all that kind of stuff. That is pitching. Don't just throw uh, one idea on his uh, you know, plate, like you, know, you put one samosa on his table and go away. He'll give it to his dog. See them. All yeah. your references. Is there any <laughs> pizza, dosa, samosa, Mysore rasam? Everything is coming. <laughs> but I think people can relate to it, no? <laughs> uh, I am one of those people. I, I am a foodie, so I relate to it. Please. So am I. <laughs> okay, here's another question from Naga Prasad. You have an idea. 
but how to validate if this will resonate in the market. Mostly we discuss with friends in all probability in the same wavelength, carrying out a market survey seems to be a costly affair. So what could be the options to make an initial head start with your idea validation? So I don't know what the idea is. If it is a new product idea, it's very tricky business. Okay, uh, It's not easy to do that. There are ways which you can test it on social media without telling the full story. I do it all the time. Most people don't even know I'm testing something. But you get a feeling. So if you are in Facebook, if you are in LinkedIn, you are in something else, put a simple thing. You know, what if something like this is available? Do you think people will like it? Very simple. Nobody will know. Somebody will immediately say, no way. No chance, boss. Right? Somebody, yeah, that's interesting. Right? Then what I'll do is I'll segregate all those guys, no way types. And I'll segregate all the guys, maybe. And somebody says, damn good idea. First, I'll go to the guys who are saying, no way. The naysayers. Ask them, why do you think this will not happen? What are the what are the issues that you think will come in the way? Find out all his objections. Because very important. Because the customers might also have it. Right? Then go to the other guys and say, listen, you say that this is possible. But if these kind of objections come, what you will do? Right? So you are actually doing very simple market research. Right? And collecting data to make a case for your idea. It requires patience. It requires tact. Right? And it requires tremendous humility. Humility because it's your idea and it is proven that your idea is wrong. It is not going to fly. It is going to blow. Then you must back off without any kind of reservation. Back off. Don't get into a fight. Well, how can you say that, Sridhar? My idea is really good. How can you say my idea is bad? <laughs> yeah, because I'm an idiot. No, so it's very difficult to convince an idiot. <laughs> so if okay. I say something like that, you can disarm the other fellow. Yes. Sridhar, cricket le eppadi potalum suthi adikireengle? Short pitch potalum adikireengle? Full toss potalum? This is a karna na na ka karna na ka cricket thiri adatta. Beautiful. He has a question from uh, Sandeep. I am. I'm not going to pronounce your second name because I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, Sandeep's question is, is there a generic template to, to go about ideation? How do you ideate? See, there is no generic template. Okay, All of us find our own ways of ideating or generating ideas. I have a few techniques that work for me, which I can share with you. Okay, First thing is, I have something called call a friend. Okay, I'll call six fellows. Right? And most of them will be completely different from me. And not necessarily all the time fellows, some, you know, uh, lady executives, sometimes my mother-in-law, all those people. You got to put the idea, don't give a speech. You should be able to spell your idea in one line. Simple. Don't give brand name, nothing. Suppose something like this is available. Will you try? So like say that I want to test an idea that there is a Mami in Mailapur who sells only Vetakarma. She is called Vetakarma Mami. Okay? Very authentic Vetakarma. And she wants to sell it to all old people who are living alone. That's a captive market. So my mother is living alone, so I want to check with her. So how do I do it? I start a conversation saying, something. At least two That's the thing. That's the thing. That's the thing. That's the thing. That's Vettokarbe with Vengayam tastes divine, but she doesn't want Vengayam. So it tells me that Vettokarbe with variants is a damn good option. Right? The non-onion segment and the onion segment. Now, simple things like this actually gives me 
the way the market is panning out. Does that answer your question? Yes, it definitely answers for me that I need to know the consumer and the yeah. individual intricacies well, uh, also to test my idea. Brilliant. If that doesn't answer, feel free to keep the questions. Yeah, coming. listen, listen to them. That's very important. You know, a lot of us go to the consumer, but we want to force our ideas on them and that's not going to work. They get very stubborn. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there is a comment from Nelson Kulande Raj. My idea as well. Vata Karamba exclusive delivery. Once again, proves no idea is a new idea kind of. <laughs> uh, I don't know if Sridhar really wanted to start it, but it was a good example. We have a bunch of questions from Christy here. Christy, would you like to unmute and ask one of the questions? No. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks for the opportunity, sir. Uh, actually, I am a web designer and I am looking forward to create a website creation platform where the customers have to just enter their details in a Google form. And once they click submit, it has to generate a website for them, a e-commerce website. That is what I am working on it. Still, it is not yet complete. But when I was researching, I feel that there are many competitors like Kata, Book, Dukan, Digital Showroom are already there in the market. So I want to know, like uh, I generated an idea which is uh, most wanted by the entrepreneurs, which I can cater to the needs of the South Indians, even though Kata Book is concentrating on uh, Hindi speaking uh, people. But I uh, I am struck up with generating new ideas. Whatever idea I think, I, uh, I see that already it's implemented. I am running out of ideas, sir. So the thing is, if you have an idea which is already there in the market, right? We have to do some mischievous work, right? The mischievous work is like this. Suppose you talk to all these people, you can get website done by anybody, right? And you're generally happy. But can you tell me a couple of things which website people never deal with, do properly? What are some of the irritations you have with web designers? What are some of the things they could be doing better but they're not doing, right? Ask for all the problem areas, okay? Mm -hmm. And see how much of that you can take care of in your design. And then go back and say, but on this design, not only are you going to get this benefit, but we have ensured that you don't face any of these problems, which is all his problems, which is all his source of uh, irritation that he's got with this. Then you'll say, tell me more. Okay. Right? One of the ways is to position the saying, are you dealing with a website creator who never delivers on time? Yes. Mm. Are you creating uh, dealing with a website designer who does not who only speak technical lingo but never in your language? Yes. So you put all the irritation and say, if you're saying yes to these five things, you have arrived at the right place. We'll talk to you in your language to create your website. See? Oh, super, sir. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sending a bill. Yes. <laughs> 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 uh, sir, uh, she is tying up with Nelson and she will send you Vatta Kurumbu. So you can... <laughs> <laughs> e-commerce, sir. E-commerce is on the wrong. Now, but on some... this one, this is no food example, huh, Praveen? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question from Muttu Kumar and I have an added um, uh, section to it. His question is, how to safeguard your idea used for a product pitch? And my added question to that is, I'm seeing it a lot, uh, lot more with the startups that I'm working on a stealth part. I'm not going to talk to you about my idea. It becomes a chicken and egg. On one part, you have to tell the idea to get it through. And Muthu's part of safeguarding the idea. How do we handle this? I have no experience on this, but there have been a couple of people who have been asking me these questions. I think we need to be smart. Uh, the thing to do is that you give them the what I call is the big ticket of the idea. What is the idea? But don't tell them the nitty gritties. You just say that, look, here is something which you can actually do to save time when you are uh, browsing. Okay? It says browsing time. Now, for finding out something, for instance, did you know that there are so many, I think, seven or eight different search engines other than Google? Okay? So we can talk about something and then say you can do this and then give them the top level benefit of the idea. And if he says, but tell me how it is to be done. 
and then say, listen, you first tell me whether you're interested in the idea, whether it is relevant for you, and are you going to do it? And if I have to tell you the idea, are you willing to pay me uh, a certain fee? If he's not willing to pay, then he's not your customer. Right? So you got to put your money where your mouth is kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Makes yeah. sense to me. Um, you will need to tell uh, Muthu if it makes sense to you. Uh, the next question is coming in from Balusami Natarayan. Good evening, sir. My question is, should we need to spend exclusive time only to think of new ideas? It's a, mm, it's a very idealistic thing. But new ideas don't behave like that. New ideas are not waiting in your door saying, oh, Muthu is busy doing something else. Right? It will come in, come in when you're having a bath. It will come in when you're walking. It will come in when you're eating. It will come in when your wife is telling you and then suddenly you get this idea. New ideas will come to you at any time. So you should have a receiver station which is open receiving all those ideas. I have a habit of noting down my new ideas which come. There are times in the middle of the night when I get up to drink water, I get an idea and then immediately put it on my iPhone. So find out your idea catchment mechanism, whatever that is. But if it is such an important thing, whosoever you are speaking to, ask for some permission to go out, capture, etc. But don't get lost. The most important thing is that don't get sucked into the new idea immediately. Capture the idea. So capturing the idea and thinking in depth about the idea should be separate. Otherwise, you will end up spending a lot of time and wasting time and you will end up forgetting about your current priorities. There's a major trouble. Beautiful. Here is a question I was waiting for. Thank you, Kalei. When should we pivot and when should we move on from one idea to another idea? It's a, it's a very difficult thing. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know how to say this. You have, let's say, three or four friends you're meeting in the wedding reception. All of them are classmates. You're all meeting for a very long time, right? So this is one friend from Coimbatore, another from Bangalore, another from uh, Trichy and so on. All of them, we're all benchmates. Okay. So when do you shift from the Coimbatore guy to the Bangalore guy? How do you decide? Right? So you have, that's a call of judgment. My point is that spend enough time with them to make them feel that you have spent time with them. Right? What's your family like? Tell me more. Where are your children? Or put me around interesting and just say, listen, there are other guys also I want to meet today. You don't mind, I can go. So every idea, do some justice to it before you move on to the other one. Right? Justice to it, now articulate it properly. Think about the benefits of the idea. Think about the potential gains that we'll get. Up to that, you come. Then objections on, we, we deal with it later. If you get into objections, it becomes a longer list. You'll spend too much time. Any idea, just quickly think out what is the benefit, what are the potential gains of the idea if we execute it. Then move on to the next idea. Then we'll come back. Does that answer your question? I, I hope so, Kalai. Uh, yes, justice to the idea makes sense. Thank you. And thank you for putting it through, Kalai, because this kind of feedback helps the speaker also because he's providing an answer and your feedback makes sense. And right. if it doesn't, feel free to... Uh, Go ahead and question. We can take up another three to four more questions. Uh, good. Now I'm going back to the basics here with this. How do I form an ideation team? You have covered it, but uh, specific to this question, Sridhar, because I know it is there in your book as well. Uh, and that's okay. something okay. I needed as a benefit okay. for all. Okay. So uh, tell me uh, the problem that you're working on. Okay. Some problem. problem. Ah, uh, I want to joke, but I'll keep that out because I've already used my wife once and Pridarshini is going to share the video across with them. Um, let's say I'll take a problem that... Um, uh, take a business wants... problem. Take a business problem. Yes. Fundraising for a non-profit. How do I get the idea across, get the message across? And uh, what ideas can I come up with? And therefore, whom should I include as a part of the ideation team? So, 
you are pitching for a non profit yes okay now uh, what kind of non profit would that be um it is in the space of disaster management and relief okay uh, and they want to create an awareness for volunteers who donate time and also donors who give uh, money correct so uh, disaster management kind of business they are in uh, not business but that's the kind of work you do so which means that responding at very short spans of time yes right you don't have the luxury of ideating and then uh, talking about it taking a month and all that on the spot you have to correct yes so you must get into the team people who are aware of that kind of work and have done things like that right so guys who are operating emergency services for the fire services emergency services in hospitals you know uh, safety guys in factories like that who all understand what it means to respond within matter of minutes you don't have the luxury of time which means that you can't really uh, analyze pros and cons or do it so if you for instance if there is a accident case the the guy must immediately say listen just check if there is too much of blood loss what do you need to arrest it right correct so you have to be able to see what is the issue what is to be done immediately some immediate action some long term action so that's the mindset of the group so these guys who are into the the planning department of a company and all that those guys are probably not the right guys for this right all the emergency type fellows are the guys for the this thing so you can see who are the guys who deal with emergencies beautiful idu varaikum na emergency e paathad illa na ka appra vaapa or naalik thai irsaan chaapla nan anchunnaanga absolutely beautiful so you select the team for that particular absolutely call. the task defines the team beautiful thank you i have got my answer uh, jawahar avichi you written a long big question it would be great if you can unmute and ask the question to see there directly sir uh, can you hear me sir yes yeah, i can no, hear no. you sir oh, good evening sir uh, sir uh, this is jawahar from pamatur uh, sir i just posted the question anyway i'll read it sir in this fast paced competitive world right so any new idea becomes obsolete uh, so fast with changing technologies i'm not able so, to hear you clearly jawahar can you speak a little louder yes sir uh, sir in this fast paced world right so we have a very competitive world and this uh, it's very fast so we have changing technologies so you know even before you know we spend our time you know we get our return on investment on our idea the technology changes and then our idea becomes obsolete so my question is like you know how do we you know foresee beyond a certain time right in the future to decide whether it's worth investing our time and money on an idea and you know because the competitors are also working on the same idea sometimes and you know even before i come to the market they they come and then my time okay. is wasted okay okay so uh, let me state my understanding of your question yes sir uh, my understanding is that how do i beat my competition in terms of speed yes is that a question yes and also not only uh, my competition sir but also the idea becomes obsolete right see you know i am working on one no no, no. i am saying you ask one question at a time yeah because uh, yes. handling also, obsolete questions obsolete ideas are a different question okay so the first is my competition right how do i beat my competition when how do you beat your competition right yeah okay now um if you are in business part of your job is to keep track of your competition right how you do it is uh, the various ways to do it you have to figure out ways of doing it and i mean there are people who do it ethically there are people who do uh, not so ethical things to understand competition but the point is if you understand the psychology of your competitor okay for instance i'll tell you for every product that hindustan use labor used to come out with nirma used to come out with a cheaper product okay so this guy will do surf and nirma will do something else i mean that was his strategy saying whatever lever does 50% of the cost i'll do this there are competitors who are like that right there are competitors who will actually copy your features and so on and so forth so one of the things that you might want to do is to consider creating a team inside your organization which thinks like competition okay right so what is the name of your organization ifni exports sir hmm 
Tiffany, Tiffany exports. So I am into coir, coir manufacturing. Tiffany, Tiffany exports. exports into coir manufacturing. Okay. Coir manufacturing. So you you put how many competitors do you have? Sir, I have close to three hundred in Coimbatore area. But the the biggest competitors, all three hundred don't compete with you. Yeah, I mean biggest, I would say twenty, sir. Okay, so you okay. must have inside your company, a company one team who thinks like that company. Okay, and rotate that team. Our number as an ancient company, only put on bed one. Right. So yeah. every month rotate the team and then say, listen, if you are in that company, what will you do? Okay. 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 So and you they you have to stretch their thinking. They can't blindly say something while on the solo path. Right? They'll say, if I was in that position, I will look at the feature in this business. I will see how to reduce the weight, or I will see how to reduce packaging costs, or I will see how to reduce transportation costs. Something he will look at every point of customer contact and say what is possible, what the customer will do, what the competitor will do. Okay, sir. Right? So you must teach your people to do two things. They must put themselves in the shoes of the customer. They must. Put themselves in the shoes of the competitor. So, if you, in business there is a triangle, there is a company, competitor, customer. It's okay. an interplay of all these three things. Okay, sir. Right? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Hope it is useful. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Co-founders, Planet Gaurav, would you like to unmute and ask a question? You have typed it in here. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, sir. Hi. Hi. Fine. So my question is, you know, uh, how important is technology as an element for any business idea? Because whenever you know you go to the investor circuit, they emphasize or rather overemphasize on the tech element, stating the causes of scalability. So what is your take on uh, technology? Technology element in the idea. Yeah. Okay. So. So I, I will address the scalability part, right? The, they want to know if your idea is scalable. If it is that you are a Karuna maker kind of guy, right? And you want to cater to the local shops, that's one thing. But if it is scalable, then I can capture the US market. That kind of thing. So the, all the, the everybody wants to see what is the volume that you can get in terms of making the business viable, because then cost per unit will come down and then margins per unit will be improved. So that's a normal thing that they look at. So you must have an answer for it. Does that answer your question? So technology is an enabler. Okay. And is it is it a must as in, uh, because since many, we need to in a way convince them that business is scalable even if technology is not there. If yeah, so do you, do you have a convincing way to do it? Uh, you, could, you must be able to say, answer all that questions. So the suggestion I have for you is that talk to those people and ask them to give you all the questions they have about this. Don't go for a pitch. You say whatever questions you have, please tell me. Go to three or four girls, put all that. Then you have the question paper ready. The syllabus is clear. Hmm. Then create a pitch answering all those questions. Right. Do that homework. Makes sense. Makes yeah? Sense. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. I have time for one or two more questions. But this time I'm going to ask a question because so many years ago, Sridhar, I attended your uh, full day innovation ideation workshop. And one of the things I noticed that you did quite differently was you brought that play dough and asked us to go ahead and do something with it uh, right at the beginning and all through. Yeah. What, was that, uh, what was the purpose behind that? Uh, the purpose is to prove to people that you are creative. See, the most of the time, you ask anybody, are you creative? He said, no, no, I am not creative. I am I'm in accounts or I am in manufacturing or I am in supply chain. You know, I am in charge of security. I am not creative. The Plato exercise was to prove that all of us are creative. If you remember, we have asked you to do create anything with Plato. There are no right and wrong answers. And I gave you only... 30 seconds or something like that. And every table, every creation was different. Correct? 
So we are all capable. We have the creative potential. We don't use it. That was to prove that. Brilliant. I it it uh, it made me feel like a kid back again. Absolutely. <laughs> so the kid doesn't have the hangups that we have, right? I mean, they do. I, I have three grandchildren. They come on uh, this thing on the phone and talk to us. Everybody says whatever they want, right? There is no censorship when they come to grandparents. So there should be no censorship when they come to bosses. Good. Another question that has come in is, um, I know I have a good idea, but I'm very hesitant to talk about it for fear of being ridiculed or, or whatever. Uh, and all of us have faced through it, maybe as a part of imposter syndrome or whatever. From an ideation perspective, what should I do with it? Should I go ahead and tell or what is your thought on that, Sridhar? See, what happens is we, we share an idea before time. See, it's like going and proposing to a girl who you met yesterday evening. <laughs> I mean, you have to let the idea mature, get to know the idea well, right? Understand the decision maker's concerns about it. If you are the guy who is going to put money on it, will you put money on it immediately? You think through. So, whosoever you are expecting to put money on it, think like him. Answer all the questions he might have. Then... When you present the idea, present it with a lot of excitement for the newness and then present it with a lot of, lot of uh, authority for the thoroughness of the idea that you thought to. So you might be excited and you must be thorough. Then he'll have the confidence to say, yeah, okay, maybe it's a thing, so let me think through it and all that. And then you just say that, look, don't worry about it. Anytime you have a question, you tell me, I'll answer it. Or you want me to be your partners and come and make a presentation to them, I will be to do that. The thing that do is that don't show anxiety. That's the worst thing that can happen. Show a lot of confidence and then say, this is for the benefit of the stakeholder. So is the stakeholder. I have a fantastic idea that will change the lives of ABC. I have a fantastic idea. I love it, but I don't know what it will do. I mean, it's not going to get you money. Brilliant. Brilliant. Lovely. I'm through with questions. Our entire audience is through with their questions. I have, oh, there's one coming in from Jyoti. Last minute cameo innings that's coming through. Over to you, Jyoti. Yes. Sir, You're also okay. Good evening, sir. And uh, very evening. enlightening and so happy. I'm just enjoying listening to it. Lots of things running in my head. But one question I was quickly reading up about you and it's like, I feel humble, you know, to even be here. It's, I just want to know, you know, there are many people you would have met, but there are some people, no matter how good your idea is, there will be somebody who will punch it down. In your years of experience, have you had that killjoy person? Oh, yeah. Plenty of them. Plenty of them. Plenty of how them. How do you deal with them? They just want to... Right. Do so, first sake. thing I do, first thing is do is to accept that there are such people yes. and don't be judgmental about them. Absolutely. Okay? So, the moment you show openness to their point of view, they know that they are, they are safe. Because, uh, you know, if I'm... One of the things that happens... With, see, sometimes seniority is a burden. When I have an idea and when I state it, there are guys who are very nervous about attacking the idea because they don't know I can come with the and talks to them. Right? So they're very sensitive. So first show tremendous patience and empathy listening to what they have to say. Fine? And then go back. Don't, don't immediately answer them. Go back the next day and say, Sir, yesterday you told me this. I thought about this. I want to share some of these with you to find out whether I have met all those objections. Not, don't ask whether you will buy it now. Yes, whether it, I have tackled all those objections. If something is missing, please tell me this. Now, actually, you are going back seeking advice. People love giving advice. Right? Once the advice is through, and then you find that, yes, most of the 90% of the objections are through, only just 10% here and there is there, is there. Then I will put a word in his mouth. It's just a listen from what you are saying. I understand that. Now the idea is more or less through with most of the objections taken care of. So do you think I am in a state to go and pitch this, this is idea to ABC people? Right? Suppose he says yes, then I go to the ABC people and say I showed the idea to XYZ, he also loves it. Which is a fact, right? So I, 
You might think that I'm a scheming guy, right? I'm not scheming. I love my idea and I want to protect it. If, if, if my grandson is out and somebody is going to attack him, I'm not going to let it happen, right? I will make sure I protect the kid. I have to protect my idea. I have to make sure it actually blossoms. I have to, you know, sow the seed, water it, let the plant grow, all that I have to do. So we have to be smart and never get hurt if somebody says your idea is not working. There are a couple of things you can do. You sell it to somebody else to do that. Too bad for him, right? Or if he's the only taker, he's only the guy who's going to be accepted, then go back to him at the right time and place. Very often, timing is very important. Let's say he's in the midst of the month, right? Outstandings are high. No money is coming in. He's worried about paying the bank dues. He's worried about paying salaries. He's worried about buying raw material. And you go with a new idea which requires a throw. I mean, timing can't be worse, right? So we need to do this homework. People who have ideas must strategize as to how and when and where and to whom they present the idea. If you don't do the homework, and you feel disappointed, you deserve to be disappointed. Lovely, lovely. Sridhar, with that, we would wrap it through. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, all of you. This was absolutely a brilliant evening.